can, uh, this mic, that mic sound. Well, while the speakers are coming down, I just wanted to say a, a few words. Um, first of all, uh, good afternoon. I wish I could have spent the whole day with you, but I was able to come in and hear parts of two talks and, and have lunch and participate in some of the discussion. And I can see that there's been, uh, you know, the energy in the room has been great. Uh, it's been a day full of it, uh, wonderful discussions and energizing information. As dean here at UW in the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences, I feel honored to be a part of that and to be learning more about this topic of big data and eco-informatics alongside side all of you. Um, I just got back from a short trip to Baltimore where I was uh, participating in a conference that involved uh, a lot of uh, deans and associate deans from many of our peer land grant uh, institutions uh, in the area of agriculture as well as industry and um, uh, federal partners, some of our funding partners. And the topics were varied, but these related topics were ones that we kept coming back to. And it's, it's easy to see that across the country there's a lot of interest in how can we address these lofty goals, as we were just saying, from, from moving from just gathering and archiving huge amounts of data to be able to use them in a predictive fashion, and beyond that, really for uh, for making decisions and making policy. This is, this is the aspirational goal of a lot of people across the country. So what our goal here was today was to begin to assess here at the University of Wisconsin what unique opportunities can we leverage? Uh, where, where in this scheme can we provide additional value and make an innovative mark? Uh, and I feel confident that, that we have great potential to do that and I think it's a real important goal for the college and um, one of the things that pleased me so much today is to see people participating from outside of the college who are also our important partners. We have to think outside the box and form new partnerships, think uh, interdisciplinarily and I, I really look forward to broadening those conversations and deciding where we can go. Um, before I turn it over uh, back to our, our hosts for the final panel, I'd like to thank uh, Chris Kuchark, Professor of Agronomy, and Claudio Gratton, who's a Professor of Entomology, and their graduate student, uh, Tracy Campbell, who, a graduate student in Agronomy, actually, for all of their hard work in putting together this sim uh, symposium. Um, and I look forward to more discussions with you at the reception uh, that follows our panel. So thank you all for coming, and let's just give a round of applause to all the participants and all the organizers. Great. Yeah, I think the microphones are in the back. Yeah, so great. So thanks uh, everyone for sticking around. We've got some questions, even some were posted on Twitter, so this is great. Um, although you guys are pretty light Twitter users, I have to say. Uh, thank you, Monica, for all the great, uh, uh, the great tweets. Um, uh, before I, uh, I turn it over and start asking some questions, I, I want to introduce one additional uh, guest uh, that we have today, and that is uh, Gary Gabriel uh, right here. Uh, Gary is a, a director. Uh, at, uh, of uh, Academic Research uh, Strategy Program at Oracle Public Sector in North America. Um, and uh, Oracle and, uh, um, uh, reached out to us and said, wow, you guys are doing some really interesting things in this uh, symposium. It'd be great if we could participate in some way. And so we thought it'd be great if uh, they could join us. Uh, Dr. Gabriel has spent over 15 years establishing business and technology initiatives within life sciences and precision human health, animal health, and agricultural sciences. He's worked within government, academic, and industry science sectors within higher education, and he's responsible for the go-to-market strategy for Oracle's uh, research at scale initiatives, and he's currently establishing business and technology partnerships with the top 20 academic medical centers, veterinary schools, and precision informatics programs uh, in the eastern U.S. primarily. Uh, Gary holds a PhD in biochemistry from Howard University College of Medicine, and uh, I thought we would give uh, Gary a chance to just introduce himself very quickly, and then I'll check. Because uh, people have come in at different times during the day, I also would like to give everyone an opportunity to just remember, remind the audience uh, who you are and uh, just a sentence about uh, where you come from. So, Gary, it's all yours. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Claudio, for inviting us. Uh, I don't want to have a commercial here on, on, on the Oracle side of things, but um, one of the things that's been interesting on 
what I've been able to view over the course of the day and looking at the, the needs for big data. What we've been doing is that we've been going out to various CALs and talking to them about this very subject. And we've noticed uh, a couple of things. We've noticed uh, some um, departments are a little bit further along, some are just starting. Um, we spent probably uh, April 10th, 10th and 11th, uh, this is this past April, uh, working with the guys at uh, NC State on their plant sciences initiative. And the, the, the biggest thing for us is that what we're trying to do, we've been in this space for 25 years, surprising to everyone, but we've learned a lot in the personalized medicine space. And a lot of what we've learned in that space we're bringing to this space. And everyone's talked about the push towards big data, the push towards cloud. Um, just like others, other large organizations our size, we also have sort of a turnkey where on demand you can get storage, compute, anything you want, machine learning. And what we're trying to do is try to match that with the right biological questions and the right uh, agroeconomic questions and the right questions coming from farmers. So we, what we want to do is start with the question first and then work back to the technology. And, and that's why we're here. Th Thanks, Gary. Actually, uh, why don't we pass it that way and uh, a quick uh, reminder of who, who you guys are. I'm Alex Smith, representing the UW uh, Master of Science and Data Science online program administered by UW Extension, targeting non-traditional students primarily. Hi, Al Hero, I'm University of Michigan, uh, co-direct the Michigan Institute for Data Science and have appointments uh, in the College of Engineering, the Literature, Science, and Arts, and the School of Medicine, which pretty much describes the interdisciplinary nature of our institute. I'm Becca Willett. I'm in um, the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at UW-Madison and am part of the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery. Ravi Sripa, part of uh, the Climate Corporation and lead the field research efforts. Uh, Parak Chitnis, I'm a deputy director at the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. <laughs> Medalia de Leon, Department of Agronomy, Plant Breeding and Plant Genetics Program here in the UW campus. I'm Paul Mitchell in Ag and Applied Economics here on campus. Hi, uh, Mark Friedel at Boston University, or Department of Earth and Environment. Fantastic. I try not to say too much. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So uh, I think we're going to, I'd like to start with a series of uh, interrelated questions for the panel. This is general uh, to everyone. Uh, there seemed to be a theme here. Maybe folks in academia are a bit uh, data jealous. Um, <laughs> how does academia get access to industry data? Uh, a related one, um, how do we explore this tension between a need for open collaborative data, code sharing, and the need for profitability? Uh, presumably that's the industry uh, data um, a part of it. And what incentives uh, can we create to actually create that, uh, that data sharing? This is open to, maybe we could start with, uh, yeah. There we go, we got two microphones, let's pass them around, Good. so. Yeah, I, I have some, some insight into this because um, at uh, Michigan we've dealt with... Is this not on? It's on. All right, um, let me, until uh, my voice gives out. Um, uh, we have um, relationships with a couple of companies which are not uh, relationships that uh, uh, are on the basis of financial support. They're on the basis of data. And uh, we found that uh, companies are very interested uh, in uh, giving data, suitably anonymized, uh, to the university to basically um, explore and see what kinds of, uh, uh, of patterns and, and other, other uh, uh, decision-ready um, uh, results one can pull from data. And what we found is that what really is the key to these agreements is involving these, uh, uh, our, involving our students uh, in competitions. So Kaggle-like competitions where the students deal with the data, they deal with the donor of the data, uh, the industry, and then uh, they follow up in some cases with internships and perhaps even employment. So it's a model that, that has worked uh, for us to some degree 
um, and uh, I think might be uh, you know a good uh, a good model for uh, other universities is using uh, the the capacity of your students to basically go in and um, explore uh, uh, data sets that the industry is more than willing to give, uh, even if they're just perhaps partially representative of their actual data, uh, and if they have to put in substantial resources to anonymize the data, if it's uh, in, in this particular case that I'm referring to, uh, is HIPAA protected. Dr. Chinnis. So I think uh, one of the other model that I have seen is kind of creating a marketplace for data where the industry gives access to s their data for certain researchers or certain other companies for a specific reason. And, it, and I, I've seen it in talks with like Phil Party gives about their informatics initiative at Minnesota where they are working with PepsiCo and other companies where say seed production company can give access to academics, where PepsiCo can also give access so that they can work with a problem with the specific constraints in terms of what they can use the data for. So there's a marketplace kind of model they're using in uh, getting access to the privately owned data. Uh, I think uh, it refers to some of the comments during my talk too. Uh, with the data that is developed by Climate or Monsanto, and there have been examples in the past where it has been given to universities. However, if the data is coming from the grower to us, I think we are bound by the privacy laws where when we don't use it for <coughs> developing a new product other than to just advise to the grower on his own fields. I mean, I, I think it, <clears throat> sorry. It speaks to a cultural uh, issue where, I mean, I don't see a scenario where Climate Corp is going to start sharing your data because that's your competitive advantage. <laughs> and there's a strong culture <clears throat> among f at farmers in the field level that <clears throat> it's their data. Uh, it's proprietary. And so, you know, I mean, that's really what we're talking about is the field level data that people are most interested in, most valuable. And I think it's, a, it's a, an enormous challenge. You know, it's going to require a culture shift. And USDA has some of that through RMA, but that's, yeah. that's you know, nobody's releasing that. No. <laughs> so. I want to zoom out just a little bit and uh, pick on a question that was actually submitted through Twitter. Uh, can we use technology, and I'm assuming this is big data technology, to preserve biodiversity and feed 10 billion and prevent the ecosystem from collapsing around us? We've heard a lot about, um, you know, m using big data to uh, push in particular dimensions. We heard a lot about yield and uh, optimizing or maximizing yield. What are, are there other opportunities there for thinking about ecosystem management more holistically? And we heard a little bit about this from Dr. Chitness. Are farmers asking for this? Is industry pushing on this at all? And what are the opportunities there? Because that's ultimately one of our goals for maintaining our healthy ecosystems. Um, so, I mean, I guess one comment that I would make uh, related to some of the work that we are doing, for example, in the context of these genomes to fields, and I think it addresses a little bit the question that Joe uh, asked before, Joe Lauer, and it is this question that we can uh, predict the weather, and therefore it's very difficult to think a context where predictions can be reliable enough to give us the kinds of answers that we might be looking for. Uh, but these kinds of data allows you to see patterns. And some of the questions that, for example, as a, as a breeder, thinking about the long-term effect, breeding is a very long-term endeavor. You start selecting and products take several years to, to see uh, the light of day. And is, do we need to be developing or um, considering incorporating variability in our breeding programs that would allow for a greater buffer to climatic conditions or different management practices. And those are things that maybe um, industry has less um, opportunity to do because they are in a constant race to achieve their productivity. And those are incredibly important questions in terms of um, deciding 
what kinds of, uh, for example, from a genetic standpoint, what, kind of, what kinds of variability we might not be paying attention to because we are so focused on improving productivity that we forget that sometimes we need to incorporate variability that will give um, those plants uh, greater buffer to, uh, to respond to environmental changes, for example. I also appreciate um, efforts from USDA to support research in specialty crops and things that otherwise might get ignored if people just went towards crops with the highest profit margins or the highest potential immediate impact. And I think some of those programs can also help encourage diversity. Um, one thing I want to add on there is, um, there, well, I had a slide in there, I took it out. It's, there's a company in Ames, that we, I went there with a, a colleague in, in agronomy uh, a couple weeks ago. It's called Ag Solver, but their, their way to do is take these field maps, take your cost of production, divide it by the um, yield that you have from your yield history, and show all the spots in the field that are not going to make money. Um, you can just quickly see, on a, you know, you, can, you get that, you get a price per bushel, and you can look at that and say, wow, I'm going to lose money there. And that's, that's how their company makes money right now, is they go out to farmers, look at their field maps, and show the spots in the field that, you know, seven out of eight years or five out of six years, you're going to lose money on that section of the field. So quit putting fertilizer there, quit tilling, quit planting the seed. Um, and often those, then you can enroll them in NRCS programs. I mean, a lot of times these are wetlands, or they're like sandy knolls, or they're edges of the fields. Um, that's one thing, and, and I thought that was interesting. And the other thing is, um, we've been involved in some projects where we've been doing these surveys. We, that one paper on neonic seed treatments, we've done several surveys on corn, soybean, cotton, and alfalfa growers. And you ask them about what's on their mind when they're making insect management decisions. First, right up there as high as, you know, effective control. The other area that's up there is human and environmental safety. Those are right on the top of their mind. They're not like, money and then human environmental safety is a third, it's right there. You can show the numbers and that's US and Canada. Farmers care about that stuff and that's not money, that's something else. And, and so I think it's really, I feel like it's contingent upon us broadly in the academic community to find a way to capitalize on that to address some of these broader issues. Pick your favorite um, conservation or insect management, you know, I'm thinking of the monarch or something like that. There's a lot of land that's privately managed that is not cropped. Um, here in the Midwest that we could generate some of these environmental benefits. And my opinion is farmers actually care about that stuff. We need to find a way to uh, operationalize that mm -hmm. concern they have. I have a, a, a somewhat simplistic and idealistic response, uh, but I, I think at the largest scale, the, the biggest thing you could do uh, to reduce the environmental impact of agriculture is uh, get people to eat less meat at the end of the day. And that's, you know, far and, away, far and away the biggest issue. Probably won't happen, but. Another question from the internet. Do we currently have infrastructure to implement machine learning and big data algorithms, particularly in rural areas? Do we have the bandwidth? Do we have the infrastructure uh, away from cities to actually do what we actually need to do? I'll address that. Uh, that CFAIR, there's a report by the Council of Food, Ag, and Resource Economists. It's part of our national association at the Ag Economists. They put a report. That was number one in their list of impediments to big data is lack of bandwidth in rural America. It's there. Are, Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say by and large, uh, no, because one of the things that, you know, coming out of the human health space, it's still a struggle in the human health space when you look at personalized medicine. And it, it literally, uh, if you just take the human side, based on where you live, could determine, you know, whether or not you get app treatment. Uh, we, just, we just looked at a, a study on cancer patients coming out of Johns Hopkins and then cancer patients coming out of the state of Louisiana. And uh, it really comes down to the fact that if you live in Louisiana you're, and, and you fail, fail a first line or a last line therapy, uh, you're more apt to survive if you're near Johns Hopkins. And so if you look at, it's, 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 it's the same thing when you look at uh, industrialized farms and the single farmer. Um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, an issue of the have and the have nots. And, and I think the challenge when you look at infrastructure and technology is how, how distributable is that technology? You know, and how can people learn from it? How can you 
set up public data databases and data sets that people can use? How can you literally come up with a decision support, easy decision support, such as the single farmer? We were we were ac actually at lunch talking about this. So we're we're literally. If, I, if I'm not a data scientist and I'm a farmer and it's, I can almost have almost like a mood ring type situation where something goes from green to yellow, I see yellow and I say, what does that yellow mean? Uh, you, you, you have to have that level of psychological understanding for the distribution of technology to remove the barrier of have and have not. So I would say right now we're, we're not there yet because we, we're not there yet in the human health side. Well, Besides the bandwidth, one of the other problem is uh, currently I think the data is being used in the big farms, right? Uh, but uh, most farmers, like in terms of numbers in the U.S., are small farmers. <coughs> Particularly in the South, there are a lot more small farmers than big farms that are in the uh, like predominantly in the Midwest. And so I think how will the big data be useful to them to make those decisions is some because they also don't just grow uh, corn and soy milk. They, they are growing specialty crops or some of the crops that are more uh, ethnically marketed. Uh, how, how can data help them in terms of making decisions? And that's something uh, we should be thinking about. I think another thing to keep in mind is that there are different levels of infrastructure needs. Um, so if we're talking about a producer generating gigabytes of data that somehow needs to be uploaded to a data center, then I think there are some, some significant limitations. On the other hand, we don't need to have each producer with his own supercomputer. Um, we do have things like Amazon Web Services that have um, server farms all over the place that people can use uh, regardless of where they're based. And so I think that kind of infrastructure, and I think Oracle has similar yeah, kinds oh, of services. <laughs> to, um, Oracle, as, as well as others. As well as others, <laughs> right. I mean, including wanna, some things to, um, that have be been developed here at UW for, for scientific applications. Um, that they all make a lot of these, these learning algorithms accessible once you have the data where you want the data to be. Uh, I mean, when you do a Google image search, for instance, there's some pretty powerful computing going on behind the scenes, but you're able to do it with a very low power um, iPhone very easily because the processing isn't happening right locally with you. I'm going to ask a question that's related uh, to this uh, idea of technology and uh, farmers. Uh, you know, when, when you talk to farmers, or those of you who have a chance to actually interact with growers and farmers, how do they perceive these advanced technologies, uh, especially with an aging demographic, and maybe this varies geographically, different parts of the country, maybe in the Midwest where there's a lot of uh, capital investment in uh, farming. Uh, it's very different than, as we just said, in other rural parts of the country. There seems to be a really big potential for a divide, a digital divide, when it even comes to farming. How is, uh, how is big data going to help the broader agricultural community rather than the really well-capitalized ones? Uh, I'll, I'll give you my perspective. Um, so <clears throat> we, were in the, <clears throat> we were in the state of North Carolina sp speaking to sweet potato farmers. We actually had this very question, and the, the some of the sweet potato farmers in the state. I mean, it's, it's varied. You had middle-aged ones, you had younger guys, and, and and older ones, and it 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 is a it is somewhat of a dichotomy. You know, you, the older ones will basically say, "Hey, I just I just want the answers." The younger the younger ones will say, "Hey, I like the answers too, but you know what? I'd like to dig a little bit deeper on what that answer actually means." So <clears throat> I think. When you look at it, you're, the, way, the way we came down on it from the Oracle perspective and how you inter interface with the different farmer needs is that in some instances, some farmers, the younger ones tended to be more, more technology uh, apt uh, to work with the information, but it's still in all, at the end of the day, their business is farming. And where, where we're looking at it, things now is that really looking at how do you build analytical service groups to service these farmers. Because at the end of the day, you know, some of them, there's a fraction of them that will want to be uh, data scientists to some degree. 
uh, but largely not. So, but at the end of the day, you want to be able to have, have accessibility. The, really, the key is accessibility. And what, so what we're trying to do is say in a place like North Carolina State University. So we've, we've now set up a charter where our goal is to, sort of to, is to develop a series of what we call uh, analytical data sprints that where, we, where we provide infrastructure, we look at a question that's being asked by the farmer, and at the outset, we're not really asking the farmer to do anything different than what they normally do on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, for instance, one of the things that we're looking at doing is that out of the 40 sweet potato farmers, we said, hey, we're just going to build you a data grab bag, and then the next, and that's, that's the only thing we said. And then so the second thing is that now what we're going to do is that we're going to come back to you, and then we may provide a service element that you can engage in as much as you like or, you know, as little as you want to. And that's going to be really driven through like the North Carolina State as an analytical group servicing the farmer. So one of the things that we're trying to be, we're trying to be very, very sensitive to the range of interests between farmers that, and we actually we saw younger farmers too that also, they just wanted the answer. So it was up and down. But the future is going to more precision agriculture, more precision knowledge, but at the same time, we're being very sensitive on, on providing service units such that people can tap into them if they'd like, or if they want to have deeper dive into the data, we give them the freedom to do that. So one thing that comes to my mind is trust. Uh, it, one thing that comes to my mind is trust. No, with, without trust, growers will not get anything from us. If you tell, an example is a, a grower makes planting decisions maybe 35, 40 times in his lifetime. Oh, yeah. A grower makes a planting decision maybe 35 to 40 times in his lifetime. If we get it wrong once, he's not going to come back to us. I know there was a comment made about uh, biased data coming from industry, but if he sees something is wrong, he's not going to buy our seed again or buy our climate product again because the trust is what drives uh, the relationship. Um, I do actually talk to farmers once in a while, and I, Brian Luck back there, he's been to some of these meetings, he's in biosystems engineering, and um, I, the farmers are, they're trying to, they're struggling too, they're trying to understand, everyone tells them this data is so valuable, this, this is going to change the world, and they're like, uh, uh, show me how. Uh, um, they're in, in big data, or these people, whatever, the, the, the climate corp types of the world, they're just another salesperson trying to sell them something. There's a bunch of people other trying to sell them new tractors, new seeds, new this, new that, everything. and so. They are, they're in business because they're trying to make a living at it, and so they're always suspicious, and they need to find a way. And so and I think my impression from farmers is they're struggling to see how exactly is this going to make me money. But they're trying it. A lot of people have tried those UAVs. Um, I'm, I'm sure Brian has seen some of that. But they, show me how is it making me money. I don't know. Joe had his hand up. Let him speak, too. He talks to farmers, too. I was just going to add one thing that I see is there's a lot of skepticism underlying hope with hope. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's interesting, the farmers that are in the business have been, that have been working with uh, big data for a longer period of time are more skeptical than someone that's newer. And I think one of the underlying fears also is regulatory uh, implications of some of the, the big data. And so there is this skepticism that, yeah, this can solve a lot of problems, but, and there's an underlying hope that, there's, that it can, but there's also this fear of regulation and, and, and I think that's a very good point that you just made because uh, if you look at the farmers' trust, they trust government very little when it comes to their data. Like NAS, for example, has a very poor return rate, uh, the National Agriculture Statistics Service, and in terms of, and going down, exactly. So they are now thinking about how they can get the data without really having the surveys returned by the farmers. Uh, because otherwise, uh, they don't get sufficient data to make uh, sense out of it. Uh, on the other hand, they do go to the private companies, and they have trust with the private companies, and give their data to them, because they think they are getting some value out of it. So I, 
If we want to stay on this topic, let's follow up. Uh, Doug, do you have a question? Different. different topic. All right, we'll go back. I want to open it up to uh, audience questions in just a second. I want, I want to touch on another topic just very briefly before our session is up. Um, for those of us who have tried to work with big data, not coming from this uh, perspective, we all learn how hard it is. Um, so training uh, the next generation of scientists is something that's a lot on our minds. Um, one of the questions uh, that uh, uh, one of our audience members asked is, how do we ensure that the emerging field of big data in ag and uh, environmental sciences is diverse? It seems to be... Uh, um, not a random representation of our uh, of our talent pool, and um, Alex, maybe you have uh, some uh, experience uh, with this. But training is is a key thing, I think, moving forward. Yeah, I don't know if I have any solutions. Um, <laughs> just patience. There are people who do want to know more about data science, and are at that point in their life when. They're ready for the challenge. And you know, across the nation, there are a lot of uh, online master degree data science programs cropping up, um, you know, a lot of good ones. And so I, I think the, the national emergence of these programs is there. I think, oh, oh. go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, I was just going to add that um, we've, we've seen in our educational programs uh, you know, a, a, an uptake of uh, on, on diversity, uh, diverse populations, but not as much as we might have hoped. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the things that, uh, you know, we're, we're actively looking at, and we don't have solutions, we don't have any, uh, any particular insights yet, um, is success stories. So biomedical engineering is one very good example. Uh, biomedical engineering among the engineering fields has one of the highest rates of women involvement in the, in the field. And uh, bioinformatics is another area that has that similar level of involvement. So there's, uh, I think, a lesson uh, or several lessons to be learned from uh, the evolution of these programs concerning women in particular uh, that can be adopted in the data sciences that uh, uh, these programs tend to be uh, much more uh, focused on communication with end users. Uh, they tend to be more focused on outcomes-based uh, research with uh, uh, health or societal benefits. Um, and they tend to be newer areas where there isn't an entrenchment uh, <laughs> in terms of you know, the traditional uh, demographics, if you like. So um, uh, I think it's, it's worth studying these other programs and their evolution through time uh, and, and how they were able to successfully uh, open up to a more diverse uh, group of students. I wanted to speak to a, a slightly different type of diversity in terms of the, the backgrounds of these students in terms of their, their, I don't know, interests and educational backgrounds. So one model that I've seen be successful, uh, especially in graduate training programs, is where you ask students to actually pair up in teams. And you would have, for instance, someone from more of a data science background tasked with partnering with someone from a biosystems or agriculture background on a specific target. And that forces them to kind of learn each other's vocabulary and language, identify core problems, and each kind of see where the other person is coming from in a way that is much more difficult when you just focus on the traditional one-way lecture um, regime. And so I think that that kind of mechanism can also help give us a, a, just a diversity of expertise when we start thinking about data science in, in agriculture. Uh, one, one other thing. Um, the other thing that we, that we are starting to do uh, for this space, we've done it for other spaces. So we have, um, we have what's called Oracle University. Um, and in Oracle University and also Oracle Academy, we'll talk about that in a minute. But Oracle University literally is really you can you can literally go online. For instance, if you look at looking at database and storage or anything in middleware or anything in app development, you can literally go online and learn the fundamentals that you can then couple to your your ag expertise. So we're, we've started at that base. Um, we just. As of uh, even today, we're trying to model 
uh, a, a course where we will use even some of our some of our cloud technology to offer up to faculty and the researchers for learning or research projects. Um, and and we're looking at trying to model that around sort of, sort of like an agriculture informatics environment, and that might even involve experts from Oracle coming in and teaching aspects of a course or having a lecture series uh, within a university environment. So even here, uh, I haven't looked at the list. We actually do with a number of universities. I'm not quite sure if the University of Wisconsin is on the list, but if not, we'd like to kind of develop that with you guys as well. All right, in the last couple of minutes that we have, we're going to enter the lightning round. If, if you've got a question, Stand up, project it clearly so that we can all hear, and then I'm going to ask our audience members to be really short in their answers, and we'll see if we can cycle through a couple of really quick ones. Doug, you're first. So for Gary, um, uh, what is the role of public universities going forward, given the fact that corporations have massive research potential, and what do you look for in a university uh, for a partnership? What is that spark you're looking for? Uh, in short, um, I, I think the way we are, our, our way we are focused now, we're really looking at, you know, we're a data company, so it's everything we look at is data driven. Uh, so that I would say that that's number one. Um, we look for uh, expertise. So if if there's a particular type of expertise that is data driven, that's another really really big star and big check. And then we look at how we can set up collaborations, not just with the university, but with other universities. So to form a network and then form a network of networks of knowledge. And those are the really key things that we look at first. So hi. Jim. Let's see if I can make this work. I, can you hear that? Yeah. Ah, OK. So I, two comments. Uh, back on that question uh, first. Um, I think in listening to a bunch of the discussion and what we observe, I think there's a unique role, obviously, it's the one that's always been played, um, of the university community. This data sharing thing is a really, really important issue, and data gathering, and from particularly the smaller element of farms, right? Larger in volume, you know, lots of them small in size. That's something that this data trust thing, it, it's difficult. Corporations can't get over that, um, or at least it's extraordinarily hard, right? So you guys play a unique role there in the USDA and, and all these other agencies. I think people need to spend some time thinking about how to incent to get data from those elements in a, in a more interesting and easier, lightweight way. It's unobtrusive to them of, of just some key small things. And I know, Claudio, you were talking to me yesterday about some efforts along that line. I think that's an important endeavor on the grand scale. Because if we don't harness and, and get more of the small farm component, into the solution long term, we're going to miss the boat. And so we have to put some concentration on that. And I don't think that's something that the corporations can do particularly well. So that's, I think, is just a partial answer to yours. The thing back on diversity that I'm just going to say, and maybe it's intuitively obvious, but from, from a corporate perspective where we deal with all industries, and we talked a lot about this, some of us at lunch, um, you, I, I love what I'm seeing here in some other schools of the interdisciplinary approach, right, and, and from different things. But I will say I come from a medical background. The medical world has a long, like, you know, decades and decades long uh, bias about how they think about analytics. We've all been taught to be very precise. We've all been taught over years, and I realize it's changing. But I'm just going to say that Wherever you have the ability within your walls to bring in disciplines from commerce and from security uh, and law enforcement agencies and people that have been doing things with big data very differently and have already learned for maybe a decade now to think differently about what's possible, it would really be a great element to try to include in your realms. Um, because we struggle in medicine all the time with we're, we're getting better and better at it. But the community as a whole has just, it's so foreign to think about true big data techniques uh, and, and looking at massive amounts of data and learning from that, that, that it's, it's always seems to be an obstacle that slows the process of evolution down. And I, so I would just say on diversity, I would think a lot about who else do you have in your institutions that are in totally different worlds of the science but have the expertise that they could really benefit your teams. 
Thank you, Jim. And actually, I think that's a great place to uh, kind of wrap things up today. It speaks to the importance of collaborating. And uh, I think a lot of collaborations are built on trust. And I've always built great collaborations around uh, um, receptions and, uh, and beers. So I will uh, uh, thank uh, the panelists again. And thank you all for coming. And uh, meet you next door here. Thank you.